delighted to be here and to uh, welcome a man who has been known in the Congress for many years. Uh, the title of the job is United States Representative in Congress. He represents not only his district, but in fact he does represent, because he's a national congressman, he represents the United States. Former state lawmaker, former chairman of House Judiciary during those days and uh, spoke here right after the impeachment. Uh, now chairman of the House International Relations Committee. He passed up a trip to go to Afghanistan to be with us, but also to vote on the um, campaign reform. A man who, when he walks to the well of the House, everybody says there's something going to happen. It's like Liszt playing the piano. Shh, we must listen. I ask you, listen to him. Henry Hyde of Illinois. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. List. More like Two Ton Baker, the music maker. How many remember him? Thank you, Tom, for that extravagant introduction. I never take those very seriously because it frees me up to ignore the booze. I've had some marvelous uh, heckling in my career. Uh, the most memorable occurred at the pool of the Royal Hawaiian. Some years ago, I was asked to speak to the independent insurers or some group. And I flew out and was studying my notes by the pool on the theory that it's helpful to know something about what you're going to talk about. And a very attractive, I might say provocative young woman towered above me in an interesting bathing suit. And she said, aren't you Henry Hyde? I said, why, yes. She said, well, I want you to know I think it's tragic that a man like you has any power at all in our government. <laughs> <coughs> that ranks with the lady who drove up alongside of me on King Street in Alexandria, rolled her window down, and of course I rolled my window down, and she said, I hope God strikes you dead. <laughs> so. I always remember these any time I get feeling uh, uh, cheery about what the world is. <laughs> we are approaching St. Patrick's Day, uh, not only by the calendar, but by the personnel who are here today. This is heavily weighted towards the Irish. And so if you will pardon me, I'm going to indulge by telling you a story. i sure it's one of your favorites, but I wanted to hear it again about the Irishman who had the private audience with the Holy Father. And as he's talking, he notices on a little table by the Pope's throne the most unusual telephone he's ever seen in his life. It's ivory, silver, gold, sapphires, rubies, pearls, diamonds. He's never seen anything so ornate. And he said, Holy Father, what is that? And the Holy Father said, it's a hotline to God. He said, well, how much does it cost to use? The Holy Father said, $10,000 a minute. And he said, well, it's a little rich for my blood. Three weeks later, he goes into Gresham's Hotel in Dublin, goes into the bar, sits down, orders a pint of Guinness, and as his eyes get accustomed to the dark, he sees the same telephone next to the cash register. Says to the bartender, what is that? He says, it's a hotline to God. He said, how much does it cost to use? He said, a two, two penny. He said, two penny. He said, how come it's $10,000 in the Vatican? The bartender says, well, here it's a local call. <laughs> I've had some. Uh, interesting experiences in my 27 years in Congress, I must say. Um, one of the most interesting occurred a few years ago. 
I was on the International Relations Committee, but I was not its chairman. But um, <clears throat> I, held, I gave an interview to a journalist from Santiago, Chile, and uh, we got talking about Pinochet, who was still then the dictator in Chile. And I expressed myself as admiring Pinochet for some things he's done, uh, namely saving his country from a Marxist takeover and getting rid of Allende. But I said <clears throat> he has left undone the one thing he should do, and that is give his people democracy. He's been in office now as head of the country for 15 years, and he, may, he could now retire, not get pushed out of office, but leave on his own terms and give his people freedom and democracy. And he would be remembered in history as Bernardo O'Higgins or uh, Simon Bolivar. Well, <clears throat> the article got the State Department excited, and they wanted to know if I would go down and talk to Pinochet and tell him that. And I avoided it for about a year, but finally they trapped me and I said, okay. So I went down to Santiago, Chile, where among other things I had a, about an hour with the dictator, uh, Pinochet. <clears throat> he was a small man, had a kind of a high voice. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think he ever smiled at least he found nothing amusing in what I was saying, but uh, he wouldn't let me bring anyone with me. So I was alone, he was there with his foreign minister and a translator, and I went through my remarks about, I praised him for what he had done, but I said he now could retire, really giving his people the great gift of democracy where he would be remembered by history. He reminded me of how many generals had run countries well, including General Eisenhower. Um, I gave him a copy in Spanish of uh, General MacArthur's great speech, Duty, Honor, and Country. But uh, we had a pleasant, but um, I thought unproductive meeting. He would not, they would not let our ambassador in. They were kind of angry at him but that I got in was remarkable. In any event, uh, later that year, they did have a plebiscite in Chile, and he lost, and he did leave the office of presidency. However, he then ascended to senator for life and head of the armed services. So he did, it was more of a lateral move than anything else. But uh, it was a great experience and one that I, uh, uh, I, I, I haven't forgotten. One of the major problems we have in our country and in the world is selling ourselves. They asked me for a title to this, these remarks and the best I could come up with is why don't they love us? We spend so much money on foreign aid of various kinds, military aid, programs, exchanges, commodities, and the more we do, the less we are admired and liked and this provides a conundrum to some people. It really doesn't to me because the powerful and the wealthy are always envied. And envy is not a very happy attitude to, uh, to receive. Um, but uh, the fact that we are the strongest country uh, makes us an object of some disdain. Countries that have many shortcomings want to project their shortcomings to, on someone else and who but the United States. Arrogant, we are called. Sometimes we are arrogant. But we do not get credit in the world for the good things we do, for our efforts to make this world a better place. And that's a function, I think, that has not been well fulfilled by our State Department. We call it public diplomacy. Well, President Bush has named a woman, Charlotte Beers, as the undersecretary for public diplomacy. And I don't think you could pick a better person. Charlotte Beers has been the CEO of two of the biggest advertising agencies in the country, J. Walter Thompson and Ogilvy and Mather. She is a brilliant woman, 
And if anyone can sell America, she can. And so they are busy reconstructing, reconfiguring public diplomacy so that we can get our story out. A country that created Madison Avenue and that sells McDonald's hamburgers around the globe certainly ought to be able to sell freedom and democracy in the free market system. One thing they're putting together is a series of documentaries on Muslim life in America to show that Muslims do live here and prosper and thrive under our system and send that around the world. Um, there's about $518 million in the President's budget for international broadcasting. And that is Voice of America uh, and the other uh, uh, public broadcasting that we're going to do around the globe uh, and uh, in many languages. We have a, an inter, internet website on terror in seven languages. Uh, so there is a co coalition information center that has its headquarters in the White House and has an office in London and in Islamabad. And uh, so I, I think we're on the move in public diplomacy. We're trying to explain to the world what we are about, what we have done, what our aspirations are, in an effort to at least reach those people whose minds are still open. Not everybody's mind is open, but that's what we're trying to do. Russia. Russia has 11 time zones across the surface of the land. It's been a key member, believe it or not, of the anti-terrorist coalition. They are providing good intelligence. They are bolstering the, and have bolstered the Northern Alliance. They have provided access to us to Central Asia. This evening, I was scheduled to leave Andrews Air Force Base for a 15-hour flight to Tashkent, Uzbekistan, uh, in Central Asia, and then to go to Islamabad and uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, and then home. But we had to cancel the trip. I can't say I'm terribly sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're going to debate and vote campaign reform Tuesday and Wednesday, and we need every uh, member there for that vote. Incidentally, Samuel Johnson is famous for saying, <clears throat> patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. He never considered the possibilities of the word reform. Um, we, are, we call a lot of things reform that ain't reform. And this bill is one in my judgment, but we shall see. The press loves it because it leaves them untouched. They can exercise freedom of speech, but others will have severe restrictions uh, placed on political speech. And I think that's dangerous, but we shall see. In any event, um, uh, we have a developing strategic relationship with the Soviet Union, with, with Russia, not the Soviet Union, with Russia that is very heartening. Uh, for example, the ABM Treaty, we withdrew from that. There was no crisis. It was all worked out in advance. There were <clears throat> Mr. Putin knew what we are going to do. We knew his reaction, but it was a smooth bump in the road, so to speak, and uh, there was certainly no crisis. Both presidents have resolved to each other and undertaken with each other to reduce uh, offensive nuclear weapons. Uh, and so we have a, a, a good working relationship. NATO expansion could be something rather explosive, but it isn't. Uh, and uh, Russia is helping uh, in NATO expansion with some ideas. Uh, there are still problems with Russia, of course. Uh, proliferating weapons to Iran, uh, 
our attitude towards Iraq, uh, things like that are still very troublesome. And, uh, but nonetheless, there is a very improved relationship with Russia. Red China, as we used to call it, uh, last April, the aircraft, the EP-3, was forced to land uh, on Hainan, and uh, things were a little tense. I can say right now things are not as tense. There have been uh, two conferences, one in Shanghai, uh, at the highest level, presidential level, that have gone very well. And uh, uh, Zhang Zemin, the president of China, was one of the first to call President Bush to express sympathy over the September 11th atrocity. Uh, we have common interests with China that are being exploited. The World Trade Organization, stability on the Korean Peninsula, and of course the spread of HIV AIDS is beginning to really concern China and other countries, and we do share that. Uh, we have differences, of course, over Taiwan, religious freedom, missile proliferation to Iran, and uh, uh, situations like that. Uh, our key Pacific alliance with Japan is strengthened, strong, and healthy, and um, useful. Korea is a problem. South Korea is fine. North Korea is one of the most dangerous places in the world. We believe they are fashioning weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them. We believe they are very much a wild card and uh, deserve the closest of scrutiny. Uh, the Balkans, of course, are traditionally, historically, a trouble spot, but we're making progress. We've seized war criminals. We have changed governments in Croatia or effected changes in Croatia and Yugoslavia. Our military is partnered with European forces in Bosnia and Kosovo, and uh, things are as good as could be expected in the Balkans. Africa <coughs> is facing a horrendous scourge of HIV AIDS. We are all concerned that there will be villages and towns of orphans with nobody to take care of them. The spread of this terrible scourge is, is, is frightening. It's, it's going to be worse than the Black Plague of the Middle Ages, and uh, the world has to pay attention and help stop it. We are doing our best. We are participating in programs through the UN and unilaterally and <clears throat> doing helping research to try to find a workable cure for this uh, very terrible problem. Uh, the Caribbean region, they're hurting because of September 11th. Decreased tourism, uh, increased unemployment, um, decreased tax revenue. Haiti is a disaster uh, spot, uh, just it's awful. Uh, so much so that money that has been allocated to them is being withheld until some reforms are made by President Aristide, and we're not going to hold our breath. Um, Latin America is very important. I have a new president in Mexico. We are all optimistic that he can do things that were difficult to do before. And uh, of course, that uh, involves drugs. We have a tremendous problem, as you know, and the drugs that come through Mexico and through Latin America, Colombia, terrible problems down there, but serious, and uh, we're well aware of it and trying to do something about it. Of course, if the demand weren't there, and if the demand is right here at home, there wouldn't be the supply. Uh, but Latin America is very important. We sell more to Latin America than we do to the European Union. <laughs> we could list the trouble spots in the world uh, and go on endlessly, 
the Middle East, Israel, and Palestine, until that gets solved or resolved or in, a, in a peaceful fashion, uh, this terrorism will always be something we need to look over our shoulders at. Uh, India and Pakistan both are nuclear powers, uh, and uh, thank God uh, they're not aiming them at each other yet, uh, but our presence in the Middle East is very important to keep things quiet and tamp down. India and Pakistan are getting along better. Um, we're going to have to rebuild in Afghanistan. Japan will be a part of that. The new interim president, the chairman of the new government, is a wonderful man named Karzai, uh, great personality. He speaks as fine English as anyone I've heard. He has relatives in Baltimore and I think in Chicago and is a very smart, pleasant guy and, and uh, we hope for, for good things. One more thing that we're worried about, the Export Administration Act is, has expired and we need to renew it. That's the law that requires licenses for exporting dual-use technology that can be used in military ways. It is foolish for us to invent super, super computers and then hand them over to China where they use them in military ways. Um, at the same time, the argument is made that, well, everybody makes them. If we don't sell them to China, someone else will. And that largely is true, too. But we need somehow to hold down the proliferation of m technology that can be used to destroy the world in the wrong hands. And uh, that's one of the problems we're, we're trying to, uh, to cope with. Uh, foreign policy is not a, <coughs> an, a, a high priority in the Middle West. It's important on the East Coast and on the West Coast because of trade relationships, but here we're more interested in, uh, in other things and agriculture and things like that. But the longer you're around, the more you understand how these things are uh, interwoven and how one depends on the other. And foreign policy is so important because it ultimately is aimed at peace, tranquility, democracy, trade, and all the things that make a standard of living what it ought to be. So I am pleased and excited by the job I have to face up to these problems and try to resolve them. I've never drunk so much tea in my life because every diplomat in the world that passes through Washington has to stop and see the chairman. And so I balance the tea as best I can try to hold down on the cookies, and uh, but enjoy. I'm given gifts by these uh, foreign ministers and presidents, and some of them are quite interesting. I have a dagger from the president of Algeria that's about this big, and it's jeweled, and I just can't wait to find someone to swipe with it, but <laughs> I don't think I will. I have a picture from the emir of Qatar that if I rub it, I know Alibaba will jump out. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, uh, it's important. Uh, we have some awfully good people in the State Department, in the Department of Defense, working on these problems. I'm proud of them, proud of their idealism, their energy their commitment, and uh, uh, so I think, as I say, we can uh, take some pride in that. I now am supposed to take questions, and so I shall try. If you'll just line up at the microphone, yes, and also give your name and identification, please. 
I thought I'd beat Jeff to it, so I'll ask the first question. You didn't mention Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, we always think of as a friend, but it really isn't, is it? They, have they done anything to freeze the terrorist assets? I understand they wanted us to return the detainees that are their nationals from Cuba and return them to them. What is your opinion of our relationship there? I think it's a good relationship. It could be better. Um, the royal family has to be very careful as to who it offends and who it doesn't. Um, it's not particularly strong country, very wealthy country. It has the greatest reserves of petroleum in the world. Um, I think they are trying to uh, carry, uh, they're trying to stand on two stools, and they stools sometimes separate. Um, basically, though, they recognize how important we are to their security and their economy. Um, I'll never forget, I was in Saudi Arabia, oh, some years ago, with the treasurer uh, who was then Mike Blumenthal of the uh, uh, President Carter. And we were invited to the home of the oil, the, the, the minister for oil. Uh, and it was a fascinating evening. Um, Blumenthal made the point that they all were educated in the United States. Their kids go to Harvard and Yale and MIT, uh, and that they should be uh, very circumspect about jacking up the price of oil because they're devaluing their own investments in the United States, which made sense. But uh, I think they're, they could do better, and they should do better, uh, but they're, they're valuable for what they do. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Congress, and uh, my name is Antonio Chen. I'm the Director General of Taiwan's Government Office in Chicago. And uh, I just want to point out, Taiwan for the last 50 years is the most reliable friend to the United States of America. And uh, we are a peace-loving country, but unfortunately our people are living under the intimidation of military attack from uh, the People of Republic of China. I do believe uh, without United States support, we cannot stand still on the ground of democracy, freedom, and human rights. So I just want to know, uh, in the near future, President uh, George Bush is going to visit China. I just want to know what is the United States position if the Taiwan issue been raised between uh, Chiang Zemin and uh, uh, President George Bush. I just want to Congress's position is to be supportive of Taiwan. We look upon Taiwan as a role model for all of Asia. It show, Taiwan shows democracy works, and there's nothing in the Chinese character that's antithetical to f free expression. You have had an election. The Kuomintang lost, which has been in power for 82,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a transfer of power calmly, orderly, um, and so you, we hold you up as an example to mainland China as how democracy works, and we, we, we respect you and we defend you and we'll continue. Thank Please. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs every, every Monday night at 8.30 on Channel 21. Congressman Hyatt, as, as, as chairman of the House International Relations Committee, what, what do you think will happen and what would you like to see happen with respect to this administration taking military actions, say, within the next year against Iraq, as well as further military action to deal with those countries that apparently host and nurture terrorist activities such as Yemen, Somalia, Syria, and on? Well, those are very important questions. Uh, I think the President indicated in his last public statement on the subject uh, <clears throat> that uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, North Korea are an axis of evil and that they will not be permitted to develop these weapons of mass destruction. We're not going to wait till it happened. Um, does that mean we're going to launch uh, aircraft to bomb Iraq? 
Um, I'm, I don't know. I wouldn't rule it out, but I would. I do believe that Russia, which is close to Iraq, is acting in our favor to try to get Saddam Hussein to readmit the inspectors. We could avoid the crisis if the inspectors, the UN inspectors, could go in and check to see whether they're developing these nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. But uh, <coughs> that is a very dangerous place, and we're not going to let them develop them because as soon as they do, they'll use them. What about Syria and Yemen and Somalia, those, terrorists, those states that are, are, are nurturing terrorist activity? Well, Somalia is almost an, a, an anarchist state. There is no government there, and it's an ideal place to hide the terrorists. Uh, we think they're there. That's why we're watching it very carefully. Again, a lot depends on the intelligence that we are provided by our other alliance members. But Somalia is a, uh, is a dangerous place, and it's an ideal place to hide uh, the terrorists, and we think they're there. Yes, sir. Uh, Congressman, I'm Marty Gleason, a City Club member and a lifelong Democrat. And as a Democrat, I'm kind of curious about uh, the title of your talk, Why Don't They Love Us? And I'm uh, curious because I see all the Republican candidates for governor, and I wonder why they don't love George Ryan for all the statesmanlike, courageous, and uh, good things that he's done as governor of the state, and they seem to be running against him. And I thought maybe uh, the governor could borrow your title, and why don't they love me? Why don't they love George Ryan for all the good things he does? Well, uh, George Ryan has been a friend of mine since he served in the House years back, and uh, uh, I disagree with some of the things he has done, but I admire him. I think he's a good man, and uh, um, if, if there is such a thing as political love, uh, my, I have some for George uh, Ryan. Yes, sir. Yes, Congressman. Uh, hi, uh, Anthony Cole from Haymarket Center and also uh, board member here at the City Club. We have uh, two facets of the uh, war on drugs. One is the uh, demand reduction, and um, as I understand, uh, President Bush has put about $60 million in to, uh, to increase um, funds in that area. And then we also have, obviously, the supply side. And, uh, and Afghanistan, as I understand it, has uh, been a supplier of up, upwards of 70 or 80 percent of the heroin uh, distribution here uh, in, across, across the world. So I'm wondering, what, can, what do you perceive can or ought to be done uh, in Afghanistan, for instance, to uh, help that country find other means of uh, building an economy that's not so dependent on the narcotics trade? And, what, uh, and on the flip side, what do you think what's being done or proposed here on, on the side of demand reduction is sufficient, or do we need to do more? We need to do an awful lot more to uh, reduce demand uh, in this country and get very, very serious about it. Uh, and insofar as Afghanistan, the same condition persists in Burma in the Golden Triangle, where they need crop substitution. Coffee is one suggestion, at least for Burma. I don't know about Afghanistan, but crop substitution and crops that are, it pays them to move. The argument in Burma against crop substitution was coffee is not ambulatory. By that, they mean it isn't worth the trouble to get the oxen into the mountains to get the beans out. Um, opium, yes. Uh, so, uh, but we need to uh, establish substitute crops and subsidize them till they get started uh, and, and continue to punish severely narcotics. Thank you very much. Richard Groh, City Club member. I note the Bush administration has made a decision not to uh, bail out Argentina, whereas in contrast, uh, the Clinton administration had uh, bailed out Mexico, which of course is our next door neighbor. Do you think those decisions were the right ones, specifically with regard to Argentina? Well, I think the Mexican bailout was the right one. It, it paid off, and uh, they repaid the loan. So, uh, and Mexico's too. As they used to say about certain banks on LaSalle Street, they're too big to fail. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know enough about the Argentine situation. Argentina is a wonderful country, a bustling country, great potential, 
<clears throat> but I, I do not, whatever they're doing, I hope it's thoughtful because it's, it's a, uh, a key uh, place in, in the world, in, in, in Latin America. Big country, um, modern country, uh, when they go through presidents, uh, four and five in a row, it makes one worry about the stability of the country. But I can't say I, I know enough about their financial condition to intelligently prescribe. Kathy Posner, wannabe supermodel. A uh, question on the... Uh, Question on campaign reform. I don't see anything wrong with if someone is very wealthy using their own money to do what they want with their life, which then would mean that they don't owe anybody or any special interest at all if they're using their own money. What is so wrong with if someone is hugely wealthy, deciding they want to do something and using their own money to buy it? And I see nothing wrong with buying a position if it's your own money buying it. I agree with you, and I think that is the law. Under Buckley versus Vallejo, if you, ha you can spend your own money, it's your money. But I'm saying, I, will there be changes in that, in what you're looking to do in campaign reform? Not I'm looking to Good. do. Not I looking to yeah. yeah. um, I hadn't thought about uh, the spending. That isn't a common problem with a lot of us, spending our own money. But. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the, the uh, restrictions on spending money in the last 60 days of a campaign, the distinctions between soft and hard money um, are all, I think, against the First Amendment. And I, I hope, uh, I hope they, they do not pass. And if they do, I hope we have a court with the chutzpah enough to strike them down. Thank you. Bob Mana with a uh, City Club member. Your own view well known on airport expansion aside, you're also politically astute. Uh, how do you see this issue being resolved? I really would not predict. Um, a, a lot of things are going for the reconfiguring of all the runways, uh, doubling the capacity of the world's busiest airport already. Uh, taking over a lot of land to do that, um, putting out of business a lot of businesses, depriving tax dollars to these communities which go to school districts. There's a lot against it too. Um, the third airport is an answer that makes sense because it will generate lots of jobs where they need them badly out on the southwest side. But uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I'll just be cheering for preserving the quality of life for those of us who live near O'Hare. Thank you. you bet. One more, this will be the last. <clears throat> good afternoon or good morning, as the case may be. My name is Don Hermanson. I'm a labor executive with Local 134 here in Chicago. I have a consist constituency of uh, 16 or 18,500 people. We're very concerned about jobs leaving O'Hare Field, going out to, to uh, the, the Piatone, the third airport. I have a mental block toward it, believe me. But the, uh, on, the, on the other side of the coin, or actually the same side of the coin, we used to be, we being Chicago, used to be number one in conventions and tourism. We're now number three behind Las Vegas and Orlando, Florida. There's $12 billion a year brought in the city of Chicago through O'Hare Field and most of it going down to, to uh, the wonderful facility at McCormick Place. All right, if we still make it hard, if we make it harder and harder for these people, the people to get to here, the, the show people to get here, or the movers and shakers to make it happen, we put them in an airport 50 miles south of Chicago and tell them they're gonna have a good airport 15 years from now, is that the answer? I think we're gonna lose not only the jobs, but I think we're gonna lose that income that comes from outside our community. And I, I for one, am very concerned about it and have not heard that much uh, talk about the economy. Well, I think the- Would you make that a question and say, isn't that right? Isn't that right, sir? Yes, I, sh I, I should have learned from experience. Isn't that right, sir? Thank you. Uh, the argument is a good one about the economy. The reason for doubling it in size, you'll get twice as much, I guess, one way or the other. But there are other factors to be considered. There's a safety factor. There's a pollution factor. 
And if Piatone could be built with a buffer for the environment and for it can be expanded, um, I think you could, would find the economy would thrive out there just as much as it does at O'Hare. Um, it's, it's important, very important. Um, when the airport expands, it will take over a lot of land that right now is commercially used and pays taxes. Um, so uh, I think we need a good study uh, on the economics of the situation and not by Arthur Anderson. Yeah.